This right here is all the right people. people. All the right people. All the right people is perfect title for this. Aaron Lip, Reed Grimm, Colin Hauser, y'all. Cassie, <laughs> Mr. Tom Bridwell, Adam Pickerel, <laughs> Rob Fraboni, Cass Haley, and you. This was not scripted. Love it. We're doing it. Don't come and knock Good you. Hey. Here we go. You ready? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This is the Big Hope Podcast, and this is a special series of podcasts called All the Right People, which is a sort of uh, look into all of the characters and all of the relationships that are forming this album of music, All the Right People. We are here just north of Novice, recording this album on Big Hope Farm. And today I have a special guest, a huge part of the album, and a huge part of my musical career, and a great friend of mine, Mr. Adam Pickrell. Thank you for being here, brother. Hey, brother. How you doing? Doing good. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being a part of the album. It's been a really cool thing. And um, I just want to give a little bit of backstory. I met Adam around 2010, 2011, and uh, we, we met, uh, I was looking for a piano player to go out on the road, and, and Adam joined us out on the road, and then that led to us forming a relationship in the studio and working together and riding together. And being Adam, friends. And, uh, yeah, the friendship was, was formed through those working relationships. Yeah. And Adam, uh, just to give you a little backstory, Adam mixed, um, he mixed More Music, More Family, he also mixed Lessons and Blessings. He's a, an amazing pianist. Uh, he, he plays every keyboard and has every keyboard under the sun. Um, plays piano, just a, an arranger, a writer. He, uh, he also co-wrote um, Wait For Me um, and, and, and various other tunes that we've, we've been involved on. Uh, he's been a huge part. And I just want to, you know, thank you for being here. Thank you for yeah. all, everything. And I want to tell your story a little bit so i want to start with with you know well let me say thank you first you know you said <laughs> thank you i get to say thank you as well you know what i mean <laughs> like i you know it's uh what's the date today the 18th of march it's march 18th 2020 guys like just just so forever history can remember where we are today coronavirus is like all over the world we've been here for six days making healing music we've been focused on putting our best hearts out there and and following you as a leader and helping you channel like your heart's goal of healing in order to like output something that's so incredibly special that you know if we're ever going to have a time to like remember that our neighbor is our brother our sister our family not yeah. somebody that that is adverse to us it's now and I'm sorry to hijack what you're about to say, man. But oh, like, not at all. No, you, no, no. You embody that. And it's so it's like it's been the greatest reminder for me as a city boy, like everybody's family. It's pretty wild that yeah. we're here on a farm yeah. in the middle of nowhere recording an album called All the Right People yeah. in the midst of the coronavirus yeah, and, outbreak. It's wild. And our hearts go out, right? Like, Dude, I, mean, I know. It's, 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 it's incredible and tremendous what's happening. And um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And it's, you know, you're right. This is sort of a reminder and a testament of like, you know what? It's, uh, we've got to move forward with kindness and not try to give in to that fear and not try to you know, obviously be smart about what we're doing. Of course. But yeah, there's know, no advocation for not staying home and not practicing well, social distancing the reality here. Is <laughs> the more people that, you know, the more people that get sick, the more people that get sick. It's a, it's a we thing y'all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very much like this album. Yeah. That's the whole idea behind this album was to sort of honor the relationships that really that created this versus going out and just hiring, hiring the hottest guy from LA or this, what, what I did in this, the process of this album was I looked back at my relationships and I looked back at the people that have helped shape my career up to this point, the ones that I was always inspired by. And I, um, gave them the invitation to be a part of this album Man. and I'm glad you took it and glad we're here. And, uh, so I want to start with when did you begin playing music? Wow. Um, man. Well, 
my parents, who were so amazing and who adopted me when I was a baby, shout out Dave and Carrie Pickerel, just the best, um, noticed when I was like three that I really gravitated way more towards toy instruments than I ever did to like trucks and guns and like kid stuff. Uh -huh. And so my mom put me in Suzuki, which is what you did in the early 80s you know, in Dallas with yeah, your child. For, for people that don't know what Suzuki is, it's a type, it's a method of, of, of teaching teaching intervals and ear training and stuff. Yeah, before it's notation. very heavy on ear training. And um, for whatever reason, it, it really clicked with me. And um, about a year into it, the teacher told my mom that she needed to get me into private lessons and that like Suzuki was great, but that it was necessary for them to start pushing me further. Uh, luckily, my parents worked so hard to be able to, you know, get me lessons and and had the foresight to push me through years of not wanting to practice. And, you know, I mean, like being a kid. Yeah. Video you know, games, maybe. Uh, yeah. And bikes and <laughs> creeks and girls and, yeah. you know. That was also like the 90s hit and the grunge scene hit and nobody thought keyboards were cool. So like yeah. there was a good amount of time where I was like, oh, crap, I Darn guess I'm going to have to learn how to play guitar or something <laughs> like grow some hair long and like right. be cool. OK, uh, speaking of the 90s, who is your favorite 90s? Were you into the 90s rock scene? Oh, yeah, man. Hugely, hugely. It's hard to identify a single favorite. Um Jeez, uh, some big records for me in the 90s. Uh, we talked about it yesterday. Uh, I think we talked about it. Stone Temple Pilots. Oh, yeah. We were talking about oh, that. Yeah. Plush, right? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Great record. Um, Pearl Jam verse, yeah. versus or verse or whatever. The first one, the purple ten. one. Or 10. Sorry, 10. 10. ten. Uh, you know, it's way cooler now when they released it without reverb, I have to say. I like the record <laughs> way better. But that record still, you know, it's it's amazing. Um and at that time, there was also like a, there was the beginning of when electronics and synthesizers were getting added to yeah. uh, like modern, like S so samplers. So how old, and how, um, you know, what, what year were you born? 79. 79. So when, when the 90s hit, we're talking, you're between 10 and 14 years old. Yeah. You know, that I music mean, scene sort of hit. I was like 12 or 13 when like Smells Like Teen Spirit came out. Yeah. I remember seeing the video super late at night on a Casey Kasem video show. Yeah. On TV. At, like, you remember those? Yeah. Like we didn't have cable. You know what I mean? So it was just like late at night on like channel like 27 or something like off channel that's like Casey Kasem's count down the hits for everybody now, you know, they did and like a TV yeah. edition of the, and it would be like show. clips of videos. They wouldn't even play the whole video, but yeah. they'd play clips. And it's like this video comes on and it's like lights and guitar and dudes jumping into crowds and screaming. And like, and it was the most like impassioned, like soulful. It felt like me right then. It wasn't old. It was fresh and new. Yeah. And it was like, Holy crap. This is like, so at that time, had you started musical relationships yet? Or were you still just playing at, by yourself as a player in your house, taking piano lessons? H had you been in a band yet? Or had you started thinking about maybe collaborating with others? I So all my friends played guitar, drums, and bass. Like, they, you know, when we got together to jam, they would humor me. But it's like nobody wanted, like I said, nobody wanted a keyboard player at that time. man. Like, And if you were a keyboard player and, and you played in a band from like, the 80s on, like the 80s and the 90s. I mean, if you remember, if you ever see live videos of bands that had a keyboard player, the keyboard player was like way in the back. Nobody even <laughs> noticed the guy, right? He was just there. Yeah, right. You know, which is cool, like, you know, but just for yeah. reference, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, during that time, I fell in love with hip hop, okay? Right. Because hip hop and like electronic music, like, like real house music, down tempo, chill out, hip hop, all that kind of stuff, the culture, the underground electronic culture, because they were using Fender Rhodes and they were using synthesizers. And like, I didn't You're know. You're a big synthesizer guy. Yeah, yeah. I was, I mean, I was then, but I didn't know how big it was going to get, right? Like, at the time, like, like Tribe Called Quest came out, right? And they had like upright basses and Rhodes and it was like jazz influence. And I was already in the jazz. And it was like, again, the most modern thing, incorporating things that I could speak to yeah. musically. Still not in a band yet. No. But you're just starting to go down that, man, starting yeah, to like, go down that rabbit hole of like, oh, wow, this is a place that I, I can actually, exactly. I can actually fit in and I can actually do something in this world. Exactly. Well, and, and honestly, man, like it's that even hadn't connected yet. So like up until I was probably 
14, 15 and went to Booker T, arts, like arts magnet. And I had Booker T's an arts magnet school in, in Dallas. Dallas yes. Yeah, so Booker T, Washington, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, they do so much for that city, uh, for Dallas, my city. And like so many kids get an education that they would never get otherwise. What year did you, when, what, how old were so, you when you started Booker T? Uh, oh gosh. Uh, 15. 15. So that was like and the first time. you were in time. school with some other players. Yeah, Name yeah, yeah. Um, Nora Jones was there. Um, I mean. Alumni, know, though. Alumni. Uh, Erica Badu's an alumni. Roy Hargrove, RIP, is an alumni. Um, Aaron Comis, one of the greatest drummers that I've ever met, is from there. Uh, he was in the Spin Doctors. Cool. But he's done so many things since then. I mean, not that Spin Doctors aren't awesome, but oh, like yeah. that guy, you know, I always feel bad saying, oh, he was the drummer of the Spin Doctors because he's been the drummer of so many amazing things since then as well, right? Yeah. Um, but, anyways, that was when I started playing with people. Yeah. Like I had played with people a little bit, but. My first experience with playing music with others was when I got plopped into Arts Magnet and I was playing jazz music, like trying to learn how to play jazz. So your first your first musical collaboration was in like sort of jazz band playing with others yeah. through jazz. And was it Full like on. like sort of expressive sort of bebop style jazz or like what I was mean, it? Yes, we were all learning, right? Yeah. So it's like I mean, like expressive is probably a little generous. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like honestly, like I mean we were but like you know that personal like instead of reading some music or learning a song, they're oh, just like were you was it just jam jam? No, it was style? sometimes, but then there like there was a lot of that on the off times, but then like the actual educational portion was very heavy with like get the fake book out and we're going to learn a tune and we're all going to learn how these changes work and like what the music theory behind the changes are and how yeah. that works and how you speak over that as a soloist and how to comp. I mean, like there's so much that comes into playing music with other people. You kind of like, it's like they teach it to you, but then you just have to keep doing it until you like learn how to listen. Yeah. At the time of you being in school and doing jazz studies and doing a Booker T and stuff, did you, were you, did you know that this was going to be your life? Did yeah, you know that yeah. like this was what you yeah. were in love with? I've known that your... since I was three. Yeah. Like that was the one comforting thing. Your calling. Yeah. I, I just have known. How like, lucky, how lucky are you to have that, right? And not only how lucky am I to have that as like a, like I know it as much as I know that like I exist like impermanently. I know that music is my path, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's led you from yeah, all and these roads. The biggest blessing of that was my parents adopting me and seeing that. Like, I cannot stress that enough. Like, the fact that my parents, like, we, you know, we were, were present were, enough yeah, to, to recognize. And that, that, like, there were not, there were times that were super hard. But like my dad and my mom made sure that they, like I still got piano lessons and my sister who's an athlete still participated in athletics, mm -hmm. even if we felt it in other parts of our lives. Like they wanted us to grow as humans. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they wanted to encourage our growth. So yeah. like the older I get, and I, I, you know, I know I like, I spoke on this a lot a minute ago, but like I'm 40 years old and the older I get and the more friends and family and the right people that I meet that have children and that like are, you know, tertiarily my children. Yeah. Right. And like, yeah. as I've grown up, I realized my greatest job with my f brothers and sisters, like you and Cassie and the kids is to like, do my best to exemplify what you teach them. Right. Like, it's not just to be a great guy. It's to be a reflection of what I know their parents are. And so like, as I gain that, perspective i yeah. just remember how lucky and grateful i am that like your parents were there yeah for from you. from like day one yeah you know like yeah. it couldn't have happened a better way that's a beautiful thing when you can have that you know sort of realization of of everything that you're everything you know we always focus on that the negative a lot of times it's, so it's, it's, it's usually the first half of your life you're focused or more you're focused on the negative that your parents did and then you could get to a point where you're like but that's just a half truth if they did all this negative they are also responsible for all the positive in my life if you're going to give it to them totally all, i mean they're probably not responsible for all of any of it but if you're going to give all the negative you better, you better give, give the, all positive. the positive yeah totally too. so it's um it's cool that you recognize the positive and the support that your parents gave you and stuff i want to i want to take the conversation on to what was the first song 
uh, like, wh- what was the first music scene that you got involved in where you really started seeing some, like, traction? House music, for sure. Like, so in the 90s... So product, music production, house music. And DJing. DJing. Like, this was 1995. You know, there was a scene of a couple hundred people in Dallas, Texas, who were, like, sneaking around and setting up generators in parks at 3 a.m. And, like, you know... Going in warehouses that may or may not have been not theirs in the middle of the night. Was that called the hazy days or something like that? Or there was definitely yeah. I was I was lucky enough to be the younger guy running around with that group of guys, (laughs) the Hazy Days Collective. So that's that's, cool. Did you know about that? Uh, Yeah, I definitely remember hearing about that. There were some people. There were some teenagers from uh, Paris that were going and and going to the the events that you guys were holding. Well, and stuff. I, and I was I was so young like you. I was even a year younger than you. Yeah. So I wasn't I I never I never was involved in the the electronic music scene, but I always always hear about it because I loved bands that were sort of involved yeah. in the experimental music world like the Butthole Surfers, yeah. Tripp, Trip and Daisy, all Dallas bands. Yeah, 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 totally. There was such there was a such a like big, experimental yes. sort of rock and roll scene. The at underground that time. electronic scene was a huge deal. So Dallas is is known and historically to be one of the bigger cities. Dallas, LA, New York, Chicago, like yeah. our big cities for house music, right? Yeah. Um so what was your first uh what was your first sort of, you know, I was bit 18. of success when in that world. So I was 18. I was about to graduate high school, and I went over and played a solo for this guy I knew. who's a DJ. His name's Brett Johnson, and um, I didn't think too much about it. He just come over and play a keyboard solo. You know, it's on a house music track, right? And the next thing I know, um, the guy who owns the label, this guy Luke Sardello, who now owns Josie Records, okay, super awesome guy. Yeah, really loves the music scene and supports. Um, he's like, hey, I have your vinyl for you. You know, and, you know, a few bucks. And I was like, wait, you mean someone's going to pay me for this and they're going to, like, make it, like, my name's going to be on a record and people are going to, like, hear it? (laughs) Yeah. And so, like, that was the first thing. And then I kind of realized it was doable at home, right? Like, because we did it, like, it was home studio stuff, right? Like, nobody's making house music in, like, a recording studio. (laughs) Yeah, right. So, yeah, like, it's, you know, so that was when I was like, I need to get a rig and I need to start making music, like, on my own and pushing Right. Like that's when I realized. So what was next? Uh, I released a few records, probably five or six different records with different guys like Demarcus Lewis. Um, this guy, Halo, out of San Diego, uh, part of H Foundation. Okay. Um, we had a track that went on a. Uh, um, What's the big one that I remember? It was a space. Oh, Cadillac. that was so. So after those days, I started a band called White Lotus Society. Uh-huh. This is where I just realized you were trying to get me to go. Um we made live house music. I love was, this track as well. Space Cadillac was like <laughs> our was like our single. And you know what's funny is like I remember back then hearing that you guys wanted to play with us. Yeah. Like Woodbelly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I remember before I ever met you, I remember the the guys at Gazellig yeah. were trying to put like a show together. 2000, yeah. 2001. They were trying yeah. to put a show together with us. It didn't it didn't ever happen, but like I remember Matt. Yes. Gazellig, yeah. yeah, not yeah. Yeah, Matt and he had that Copacetic ballad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, totally. um, yeah, that was. I remember that. Um, anyway, so White Lotus was cool, man. It was Corey Lacey, who is a just one of the greatest keyboard players, singers, and and just all around musicians I've ever met. Dave Monsey was on the bass. Now, Dave Monsey, Dave Monsey, I, I recognize that name. He yeah, br- you brought him in on. Uh, he played on Hole. Mm-hmm. Uh, on more on music, home. more family that we did with Tubby Love, Dave Monsey on bass, and yeah. da- Dave has played with everybody, right? I yeah, mean, man, the guy toured of... with Fiona Apple. You know, he's a huge part of what Edie Brickell does. Yep. Uh, and man, he's a huge part of who I am now. Like, did he play with uh, Derek Trucks and them at the time? He did for a little bit. Yeah, he played in the Tedeschi Trucks band for a little bit, and then he also played uh, a big thing that I think is important is the band The Sparrows. Oh, Carter. He was he and Carter were like brothers and and he was the bass player for pretty much everything Carter was doing. They were yeah. like inseparable. RIP Carter Albrecht, man, just just yeah, like a light man. that got taken out way too soon. No doubt. What a tragedy. So, from White Lotus Yeah, so from White Lotus um you know, that was White Lotus was doing really well and then the economic crash happened. Yeah. And there was no gigs. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I just kind of hunkered down and wrote music. Um, actually went back to school to UT Dallas yeah. and studied marketing, which I still haven't ever actually done anything with that degree or, or studied right. uh, uh, digital stuff. Anyways, yeah. um, around 
my junior year of college, I get a call from this guy, John Congleton, who's a producer. At that time, he was in Dallas. And he's, he's to this day, I mean, if you don't know who he is, you probably should, because the guy is like one of the most brilliant, 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 brilliant guys that I've ever met. Um, okay, can you come do a keyboard session? Sure, sure, sure. So I show up with a couple cents that he asked me to, and I walk in, he's like, hey, this is uh, Annie Clark, St. Vincent. Ah. And I was like, oh, snap. Like, I know who she is. Did you is. know who she was Yeah, at the yeah, time? yeah. And, like, that's, on a side note, like, one of the coolest things when you are a session player is getting to play for people that you're a fan of. Yeah, right. Like, it doesn't happen a lot. Yeah. And it's really, it's, like, a super honor. So, like, I got to play on... But this is before she was really that big, right? This was, like... I don't know. She was big to me already, right? But, like, I mean, I think that this was... this. So, this ended up being her self-titled record, right? So, I played on three songs on the record, uh... And then the record ended up winning a Grammy yeah. for best alternative album. So John and Annie got Grammys out of and that. Did you play mostly uh, synth on the record? Yeah, Mini Moog and and um, Arp Salina and a couple other like things. The main keyboard player on that record's name is Bobby Sparks, who's also like one of my biggest influences and has yeah. been a huge. How you much? Know, how much of your? How much of your synth uh, techniques and stuff? Did he? Did he give you some cues? Did he give you some lessons mm -hmm. on the on the? Because you spent time with him on the road as well, besides for recording with him. Yeah, I mean, we've been friends for a long time. Um, I learned a whole lot about the B3 from Bobby, um, the organ player that I am today. Uh, we have totally, you know, we we don't sound alike. We have we have similar vibes in that, like, he really helped me tap into, like, some of the most, like, primal parts of myself when I'm, like, wanting to dig in on the B3. Like, and you... Get it. Yeah. You Testify. just, like, yeah. And, and yeah. It's, 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 like, it's super, like, like, that sound is spartan and primal when it comes down to it, like, uh -huh. at times. Or it can be really sweet. But there are moments when you just have to, like, really let it hit hard. So, uh, thank you, Bobby. Like, one of the greatest, man. Um, he's played with Prince. He's played with Snarky Puppy. He's played with... Oh, dude, he's like, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's worldwide he's, he's good, legendary. He's, he's good as it gets. Yeah, if you, you don't, don't know, know about Bobby, Bobby yeah. yeah, get go it. And then it he's out. got a record out right now, too, the Bobby Sparks experience. So, like, go go get his record, too. It's so, a, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 I mean, um, it's, it's funky. I tell you what, the, you know, when... Um, Going back to my opinion of you, you know, when I first started playing with you, I could, I could, I could automatically tell that you had something a little bit different from anybody that I had ever played with before, as far as the level of talent that you had and the the, the level, the, the your ear and your ability to bridge things musically. And I'm, I'm so I'm an uneducated musician. You know, I grew up playing blues with my dad, learning a few chords, um, but I, you know, I and I've played with all kinds of educated musicians. But you have something that it, that goes beyond just being educated. It's like uh, a, just a, a a sense and an intuition about things that just just goes above and beyond what I've experienced from a lot of educated guys that I've played with. And uh, I'm honored to be here with you. And and I'm super excited we could do this talk today. I want to finish up with one last thing. I want to talk about what like what do you think about like we're almost finished with this record. Yeah, like if yeah, you, yeah. If you had to, if you had to talk about like what we're doing here, how could how, could you put it into you know a couple sentences of like what do what do people have to expect? Sure. Um, um, let me let me just so we have it. Let me give a shout out to Nelly and the rest of the of my story because cool. like post Saint Vincent, John got me on multiple other records, but he uh, notably for my life and career pulled me into a session with Nelly Furtado, who's a Grammy winning recording artist. And performer. Um, we oh, we all know who Nelly is. We, I'm like a bird on a fly away. Yeah. I know she's bigger than that song, but I love that song. I, I do too, and I love her. She's <laughs> So we did, we did one song together to test the roads, and then she did a whole album with John, and I got to play on it. And um, John recommended me for the music director position once the tour was going to start. Again, I can't thank Congleton enough for everything he's done for me. Um, That's awesome. Um Yes. All, all the right people. Yeah, totally, John, man. It's all about relationships, yeah. and that's what it goes back to, man. Yeah. It's like if you and John hadn't managed y'all's relationship, you know, in, in right. a healthy, balanced way, and that's what I mean by this, all my, all, you know, to honor your relationships. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean just to be a, being a good friend means managing it and balancing it, mm -hmm. you know, and being accountable and being present, you know, yeah, and that's and what thinking it, of that, the other. Totally, and making sure it's balanced. Yeah. 
Yeah, no. So John, I mean, like, I'll never feel like it's balanced. He's given me so much. Uh, I'll do, do my best to always be there as but the you're, best. You're attempting to balance. Yeah. It. And so I, that, all I can say is like, alone. say with you, man, like you've been such a sweetheart to me and you just like, you continually like bring me into things that make me a better person and a better musician. Like I will always do my best to that's bring my best self you, to it. You know what I mean? Like that's the only way I can truly balance the equation is to just bring my best and yeah, like, man, or you, try to. You bring a lot and your heart is gold and you're talent is tremendous and Thanks, in, 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 just incredible and I'm honored to be here I want to know one last thing what do these people have to expect from you with this album what do you what do you what do you, I mean I know that's a hard question to answer but what is your like what what is this what do you think what if, if how are you processing this whole experience with Verboni and the way that it sounds oh, and the mixture of styles and what is it man it's Man, you know, I mean, you know, I hate, I, okay, this was not scripted, okay? So, like, <laughs> when I say it's all the right people, like, I swear this was not, like, uh, you know, no one gave us a cue card. Uh, that being said, man, like, you know, and this is going to be a crazy comparison a little bit, but, like, one thing that I always think of is, like, one of the things that Miles Davis did, besides be a great trumpet player, was he knew how to put the right people in the room to get something that was so much greater than any single one of them. And I'm not trying to compare myself to anybody who worked for Miles Davis, nor am I comparing anybody here to those levels of guys, because those are like our legends. That being said, I think that your ability to put, because like, I didn't know the other guys in the band until we started today, or yeah. started the other day. This week, right, yeah. yeah. Like week. Aaron Lip. Um, Reed Graham. Yeah, Reed Graham. Like, it was a really cool thing. Rob Fraboni, who's like, I mean, I don't even, I can't even get into how much my mind's been blown by that guy. You <laughs> no, know what I mean? Like, right? he just fucking just goes at it, man. Off, yeah. Man. And he just, he just, he just exudes like, like that era. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he, he was there. Not only was he there, he helped create it. He helped paint the picture for yeah. us. What we think of is that era is because Rob helped make that portrait. Definitely. Yeah. On the, on the, you know, sort of on the blessings of people like Tom Dowd and Al Schmidt and yeah. all these great engineers that yeah. produce records with real moments and like, you know. I mean, the guys work from everybody from Bob Dylan to Sun Ra. I mean, like, right. it doesn't get any cooler than that. It really doesn't. Man. So what to how, expect from how me? How often do you get to work with somebody that takes Joe Cocker down to Jamaica and has the Whalers on a, on a, on a few tracks with Joe Cocker and That's, Steve Gadd's with him too. Oh. And it just keeps on, you know, it's yeah. like, cause you just, you know, it, it's been incredible, man. Yeah, man. Like, I, I'm, you know, I feel like I made a friend and a teacher right. with Rob. Like, I feel like I made a friend that's going to, like, give me some lessons and blessings for, yeah. like, the rest of my life. Yeah, you know what man. I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, to answer your question, man, like, I hope that what can be expected from me on this record is, like, my best self and my heart and, like, my willingness to make sure that, like, I do the best for like what you intended and like what what your message is because like i love being a musician but one of the greatest things about being a musician is being able to get behind a leader and help be part of them like it's like a magnifying glass in the sun right like you're part of what this whole thing is is you are the guy who channels it all in the sun and now you can burn something down there right well, me like, and cassie yeah you cassie sorry <laughs> sorry why don't we just get ca she, come over yeah, here? Yeah, no, come she's here. got her she's come got here. her time in the sun. All right, well, I gotta say this too. I love Cassie Haley like my own sister, and uh, Cassie's the real Steve Jobs of this whole thing. <laughs> she's. So three, I got one she's last the, thing. This she's she's the vibe the vibe maestro. Yeah, three words for this album. Any three words? Oh, love each other. That's it. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Big Hope Podcast. Thank you for being here, Adam. Dude, thanks for having love me. You, love you, and I too. can't wait to zip up this album today. It's going to be gonna crazy, man. It's going to be awesome. And everybody stay safe out there. I know yeah. by the time this comes out, coronavirus will hopefully be gone. But now you know we're right in the or middle managed. of it. Yeah. <laughs> or managed. Yeah. We love you guys. See you guys. Bye.